and s squared ps ds and this is the expectation value of s squared so the variance okay so we looked at a particular case oops i should not be completely in front of the camera um, when you when you have um, a magnet with different spins uh, we looked at the zero zeroth moment um, maybe i will um, do it again because i did it very quickly last time so the the probability distribution of the magnets is e to the negative 2s squared divided by n uh, ds. OK. Um, and we had another uh, factor in there. We had the 2 divided by pi over n to the 1 half. And you know, this is the Gaussian distribution. So if you go to very large values, the area under the curve is essentially 0. So you can safely say that this is from minus infinity to infinity. And the substitution that we're going to use, um, we're going to let x squared be equal to 2s squared over n. This implies that x is just the, it's 2 over n square root of this times s. And so dx is going to be 2 over n square root of this ds. Um, I'm going to move to this other side. So ds is n over 2 square root dx. So we just move, move it to the other side. So we can rewrite the, this integral as uh, 2 over 2 pi n 1 half integral from minus infinity to infinity. And from the ds is going to be this. So we can just put n over 2 square root dx and e to the minus x squared. So this one over here. Um, and that's it. We want that to be equal to, to 1. So this square root of n goes away with this one, and this one with this one. So that is going to be equal to 1 over pi And this integral, you can see it in the appendix. So it is equation a point four is equal to. Uh, sorry, this is to the one half. This is equal to square root of pi. 
So then you get square root of pi over square root of pi equals one. So the probability was already normalized. So this is the factor that normalizes the, the probability, the total probability. And then we did um, uh, this case. So we had an S over here. So to get the, the expectation value of S or the mean. So there's another S over here. And we know what S is over here. So we end up with um, expectation value of S Now this one, instead of being one half, is gonna be two halves because you also have this one over here. And then this one is x e to the minus x squared dx. And um, I told you that this one uh, is not in that section of the book uh, because it is equal to zero, but it is easy to see why it is equal to zero. You have your distribution. So the e to the negative x squared, and then you multiply it times this, you know, just a, a straight line. So this is gonna look, uh, maybe a little bit like that. And then on the other side, it's gonna look exactly the opposite. So the area under the curve um, is gonna be equal to zero. So this is um, an odd function. And the other one that is in the book is the S squared, right? So S squared over there. So the second moment, we have, well, this stuff, and it's gonna be equal to two over pi n to the one half. Now this one is n over two to the three halves. So you just keep adding, um, the roots of two divided by n. Integral from minus infinity to infinity, x squared e to the minus x squared dx. And this is not um, an up function, this one is even. So if you have your distribution and you're multiplying it by that, which looks like that, um, the total thing is gonna look it's more like this, right? So you can, change the limits of integration if you want, because this one is even. Uh, so you can do you know, twice from zero to infinity, it will be the same, but you still have to 
uh, solve that integral, it is not equal to, to zero. So, um, this one is in equations appendix five and appendix six. It says um, two from zero, no, twice, two times, uh, the integral from zero to infinity of x to the m e to the minus x squared dx is equal to gamma of m plus one. And this is the gamma function. Um, you can find tabulated uh, values. Here, n is equal to m minus one divided by two. So uh, m is two, we have the two over there. So for this particular case, is gonna be two minus one divided by two, one half. Right, so for the case uh, m equals two, it's going to be equal to one half plus one. Right, so n was one half plus one. So gamma function of three halves. What is the gamma function of three halves? Can you go to Wikipedia? So, oops. I typically use, well, I actually use this book a lot. Tables of integrals and other mathematical data. You can find similar books. Um, you know, I like them because they have all the integrals, but as opposed to using Mathematica or something like that. Um, it, it gives you it's one data. half square root of pi. One half square root of pi? Yeah. Awesome. So this one is... Let me see. Not super useful in this case. Mm. Let me see. So it does have the gamma function, but it has the numerical values. So it's nicer you know, to have one that gives you the exact values. So square root of pi over two. Okay, so um, then that's the, the integral. And mm, this one was going to be mm, I guess it will cancel one half. So it's going to be uh, this one, one half square root of pi, and then we have this square root of pi over here. Uh, and then we're gonna have two, and then we're gonna have n divided by two. Okay, so the twos go away, the square roots of pi go away, and this is the, the variance. Um, I feel like mm, 
And I feel like I'm missing a, a two somewhere, but. So before in, Yeah, that's, I think that's fine. So if you look at page 15 of my notes, you know, we, we solved it before, uh, but here we solved it mathematically. So this is the, the variance, so it's the width of the, of the distribution. Okay, awesome. So that was the end of chapter one. We're going to start chapter two now. And chapter two is basically a bunch of definitions, but the definitions are pretty important. We're gonna be using them all the time. So, um, Uh, chapter two starts on page 29. Okay, so the first definition, we talked about it before. We're going to uh, formalize it a little bit more. Fundamental assumption, you can see that, right? Yes. A closed system. So this is not the definition of closed system yet, but we're going to define closed system also. A closed system is equally likely uh, to be in any of the quantum states accessible to it. We are also going to look at what accessible is. Um, so over here, we mentioned quantum states. Um, uh, you know, for sure, they. Uh, this will apply to uh, any states that you have seen in in quantum mechanics. Um, but it, it generally, uh, it's it's a little bit broader. You know, it just means that these states are uh, are discrete, right? So. You know, let's say that you have your, how many have taken uh, quantum? Have you taken quantum? Not yet? How many say yes if you have taken quantum? Nobody? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so a couple people. So this would be like a typical you know, case from quantum mechanics, right? You have the, uh, the, the wavelength of a particle in a, let's say in, a, in, a, in an infinite box. So it can have this wavelength, it can have this wavelength, it can have that wavelength, but it has to be uh, an integral 
number of wavelengths, or I guess here is one half, but one half or, or integer. And so you cannot have just everything. In classical mechanics, you, know, you, you have a, a continuum, uh, but in quantum mechanics, you are limited to discrete um, quantities. So what we mean here by quantum states is that you can, you can count them. Okay, that, that's, that's the only thing that it, that it means. Okay, so uh, definition of closed system. Any, any guesses? I think that one is relatively uh, intuitive. Does it change energy with the environment? Does not change energy with the environment. Yeah, that's definitely a characteristic. What else? Keeps the same energy to itself. What's that? Keeps it's an, its own energy to itself. It has its energy to itself? Keeps, keeps it. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. So um, definitely the energy is constant. Um, but it's a little bit more constraining. So the number of particles also has to be constant. And anything that might influence the energy, for example, the gravitational field has to be constant, right? So you can have your system there with a bunch of particles, but then, you know, you move the sun close to it and then the energy of the particles is going to change. So that cannot, that cannot happen. Okay, so energy constant. I have a question. Yes. Um, I, I thought um, closed systems were capable of exchanging energy uh, with um, the environment. Um, well, we're going to expand on the definition of a closed system. Uh, okay. But you will see. Wait, 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 uh, wait. Ten minutes. We're gonna get there. Um, but you know, in in general, you should think just like this thing that is completely isolated, right? Energy is constant. Um, number of particles. is constant and also you know like the gravitational field the electric field anything that might change the energy has to be constant So the you know the whole environment might be a closed system, for example. Okay. So now uh, accessible. Accessible uh, quantum state. Its properties. Are compatible. with the physical specifications of the system. So what could be a physical specification? It could be the energy, for example. 
right? So if you require a lot of energy, you know, to move your system from one state to the other, and you don't have that energy, then uh, that quantum state is not accessible. And there is, let's see, for large systems, we don't know uh, We don't know uh, energy or number of particles exactly. Yeah, you cannot really start counting the the atoms in a you know in your in your sample. You have to make an approximation, and also for the energy. Uh, but what is going to be true is that any uh, energy fluctuation, so delta U, is much smaller than the total energy. Um, just like we saw with with the number of spins, right? So the number of spins is related to the uh, spin axis, and it's always you know much smaller than the total number of spins. So if you divide this one by u, you just get that the any fluctuation in the, in the energy is much smaller than one. And any fluctuation in the number of particles is much smaller than one. The other uh, aspect that matters about the accessible quantum state is the the time scale. So in a relevant time scale. So the example that uh, Kittel and Cromer mentions is that of silicon uh, oxide. So silicon oxide can be in crystalline form or in amorphous form. So what is Crystalline silicon oxide. Uh, quartz, something quartz. like that. Yeah, yeah, it's quartz. So if you go to the beach, then you you're gonna find a lot of silicon oxide. Right? It's, uh, I think silicon might be the most common uh, element on Earth. It's definitely like top five or six. Um, what happens if you make it amorphous with some heat. What do you get? Glass, yeah. So this is your windows, right? Your window panes. So um, you can wait for your whole life, um, you know, for the silicon oxide, amorphous silicon oxide to become crystalline. It's not gonna happen. I guess you can see it even with, you know, like really old cathedrals and that kind of stuff that have been there for, I don't know, 800 years, and you know, they're still amorphous. So even though the, uh, the energy that separates them, you know, in principle is not that big, it, in reality or in, in practice, it's not an accessible quantum state um, because it's never gonna change. Okay, so the relevant time scale is the time scale of your experiment. You know, if you're if you're measuring for one minute, then um, that accessible quantum state have to be accessible, you know, in, uh, less than a minute. 
So these are the caveats of accessibility. Okay, so now consider Let's go back to our uh, Pascal's triangle. So we have a system that looks like this. Where do I want? Okay, so here in this axis, the horizontal axis, I have the number of spin, spin down. And in the vertical, we have spin up. Okay, so this is zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three, four. And using that, pictorial notation that we used before. This is, I guess, one case in which you have all the spins up, and then you're gonna have three in which one of them is down, and then another three in which two of them are spin down, and then one case in which all of them are spin down. Okay, so if we want to represent this, um, this, this possible configurations of the system, then we will have you know, zero spin downs, three spins up, and then here we will have one spin down and two spin up, and then over here, this one over here, Two, one, one, three, and zero. Okay, so these are the states that are available to the system. Right? You only have three spins, so you cannot have four spin downs. Right? So this is kind of the, the limitation. And of course, here you have. Uh, one possibility, but over here you have three, and over here you also have three. Okay, so we had the, uh, where was G? Multiplicity, right? Uh, for example, as a function of N, and as a function of um, s. So this one, you know, each, uh, I guess for a, given, for a given n, each s will give you how many options uh, you have. So it will be this three over here, or this one over here, or this three, or this one. And so for this very small case, you know, your distribution just looks like this. So here G is equal to one. Here G is equal to three. G is equal to three. So the uh, um, you know G of mm, well that this doesn't work very well for uh, even distributions, but I'll be a little bit more explicit with the G. So essentially, if you have a Gaussian, you know, a, a normal distribution, and you look at a particular value of that distribution, the height of that distribution at that point is the multiplicity, right? Is the number of um, of possibilities that you have. Uh, to arrange your system so that it is consistent with 
you know, the spin or the energy, you know, um, that you're that you're measuring. Okay, so we have a definition of the multiplicity. Multiplicity G is the number of states um, available to the system that are all equally likely. Okay. G is uh, the most important quantity in this course. And you will see in a little bit why. So if the probability is equally likely, you would say that you're going to get um, you could get this one, or you could get this one, or you could get this one. You know, the total spin is the same, and the probability that you have each one of these is the same. So your probability distribution is uniform. And that means that the probability of each state is 1 over g. In this case, the multiplicity is 3. So there is one third probability that you're going to get um, each one of these. OK, so this is. Um, Equation, you know, Kittel and Cromer, equation 2.1, chapter 2, equation 1. Sir, sir yes. is that the fundamental assumption? Yes. Oh, cool. Yes, it is. We're, we're using all the concepts. This is definitely, this is the, the fundamental assumption that they're equally likely. But it makes sense, right? There's nothing to prefer one over the other. Sir, and then why is it an assumption if it's just really clear? Because you cannot prove it either. You cannot prove it mathematically. Oh. You have to, to assume it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a bad assumption, right? It's almost like, um, uh, you know, Euclid's uh, axioms, right? You just like, okay, this seems to be self-evident. But once you want to prove it mathematically, there is no, there's no mathematical proof. That's why it is an assumption. Um, okay, so yeah, the other equations over there. So equations from two point one to through 2.4 are, this is one, this is another one, sum of the, of all the probabilities equals to one, you know, we impose that. This is 2.2. Um, the expectation value of, I think they use capital X, of X, is the sum of all the states um, x of s, and then the probability of s. And this is also equal, because of this, one over g. So there's this, this equation 2.1, 2.2, 2.4, 2.3, 2.4, 2.3, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4, 2.
2.3 and 2.4. They're um, um, all related to what we just saw. Okay, so we need a few more uh, definitions. Uh, let's consider a system of spins, but n is larger, so n is equal to 10. Uh, we derived before uh, equation 1.15, uh, that's the multiplicity as a function of the number of spins and the excess spin. And this was equal to n factorial n up factorial n down factorial. And this was also equal to uh, the n factorial over here. And then we had this expression. Mm. N. Right? So this is just, you know, uh, Pascal triangle again. So I drew uh, the distribution. It looks, um, looks kind of like this. So the maximum value over here is uh, 252. Okay, it was more like, like that. All right, so 252, 210, um, 120 over here, 45 over here, 10 over here and one over here. So I'm not going to draw um, figure 2.2, but you should look at it. So you have um, the case for n equals 10 and spin excess equals eight. So they divide um, all the all the cases, there's 10 of them. So they just have so they just have letters uh, to label them from A to J. And the first one you have spin down and then nine. spins up, and so on, okay? So this is important because uh, this whole thing is an ensemble. Um, of systems. Okay, this is the, uh, the definition. Um, so it is composed of many systems constructed um, alike. Each system in the ensemble is a replica of the actual system in one of the quantum states accessible to the system. So each of these states, A, B, C, D, is accessible to the system. 
with equal probability. So the kind of you know, perhaps uh, conceptually different um, aspect about statistical mechanics is that it uses ensembles. And so if you measure your system you know, at, at any instant, it's going to have only one configuration, right? Uh, if you measure it again, it might have the same configuration, it might have a different one. It might never reach you know, a particular configuration, D for example, maybe it will never reach D. But you consider all the possibilities, you know, all the ways in, in which they can be arranged. Right? So you're, you're thinking about all the possible ways in which the system can arrange itself, even if it never gets to that, to that, uh, to that particular state. Okay, so this concept of ensemble is is very uh, well. It's very it's the basis, one of the basis of statistical mechanics. A little subtle, also. You know, like in in probability, let's say that you're playing with with dice. Uh, you you build this space of possibilities, um, even if it never gets there. Uh, this is the same, but for for physical um, possibilities. And so you have other stuff like equation two point uh, two point four, the expectation value. This is an ensemble average. So you get the any quantity that you want, you know, the energy or whatever. Um, you get the average of that quantity throughout the whole um, uh, ensemble, right? All right, so let's keep going. Now we're gonna talk about Thermal contact. So consider two closed systems. Uh, the first one is system one, and so that we don't get confused with the spins. Let's make it like a script S or something. Looks like an ampersand. It has energy U1 and it has number of particles N1. And you have another system. This one is, oh my gosh. I forgot to record this, this is horrible. Oh, well, sorry, <laughs> just thought about that. <clears throat> okay, so this um, second system has U2 and N2. Sir, there, there is something on the screen. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Oops, okay, fix. Yes, sir. Okay, so we are going to bring these two closed systems into, in, 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 they're gonna be in contact. So just because I'm lazy, I'm just going to extend this to over here. So now they are in contact. And you know that 
that phenomenon is pretty uh, pretty familiar to all of us. You know, we can touch something. Um, we are not quite a closed system. In this case, the chalkboard is not quite a uh, closed system, but you know, we're close to that. So this is the approximation. So uh, something that we know is that the energy is conserved. So the energy after they touch is equal to the energy before they, they uh, come into contact. OK, so thermal contact means that the two systems can exchange energy. They cannot, they can't exchange particles. OK. Energy can flow between the boxes in you know, the closed systems, but the number of particles remains the same um, in each one. So I guess one way to represent that would be um, U, which is uh, U1 plus U2. If you take the derivative, the derivative of U, it's going to be du1 plus du2. The derivative is equal to 0. And the whole thing. But for particles, dn1 is equal to 0, and dn2 is equal to 0 individually. Right? So the number of particles is not going to change yet. Um, later in the course, we're going to see what happens when the systems are allowed to exchange particles. That, that's called a diffusive uh, contact. So here we focus initially. Uh, just on the thermal contact. And mm, OK, I wanted to get a little further, but So if we continue using our spin uh, magnet model, we can bring uh, one magnet here and another magnet here. And even though, you know, in more generally, we think of the energy as thermal energy, so kinetic energy of the particles, uh, actually, it can be any any energy. So if you the energy, if if you uh, put this system in a magnetic field, then the energy is going to be um, negative m dot b uh, for each spin. So the total energy is going to be minus two. We have two of these. 
uh, M, B, state one plus state two. So you don't need to um, remember or actually have seen uh, this equation. Um, it's just enough to uh, realize that the energy is proportional to the number of spins. So the minimum energy state of the system is when the spin exit is equal to zero. If you want to move more of these spins in the same direction, they are going to hate each other. And so you need to provide some energy to do that. So energy could be thermal or it could be um, just from, uh, it could be magnetic. So another definition is configuration. is defined as a set of all states uh, we specified values S1, S2. So each of these um, closed systems is in a state. Could be a state S1 and, and state S2. When you put them together, then that is a configuration, right? So you have a set uh, of states. So the The number of states that you have for system one is G1, which depends on N and S1. And the number of states available for state for uh, system two is G2, uh, it should be sorry, N1. N2 and S2. So what is the total number of states available to this configuration when you have the two systems together in thermal, equal, in thermal contact? Well, G, let's call it G, is equal to G1 times G2, right? Just like having you know, four ways of doing it here, and then you have another uh, system, you have six ways of doing it, you just multiply the possibilities. Okay, so we can decrease the number of variables. We can just say that, well, S is equal to S1 plus S2. This implies that S2 is S minus S1. And then we can write this G as um, G um, N1 S1 times G2, N2, S minus S1, right? So we decrease the number of variables. So we can, this is equation 2.7. So the multiplicity of the whole thing, and this is for a particular value uh, of S, the multiplicity is gonna be uh, 
sum over all the states S1 of G1, N1, S1, G2, N2, S minus S1. And now we're going to define another term. Most probable configuration. What do you think is the most probable configuration? Well, we know that this is going to look, this is the product of two normal distributions. So it is going to look like a normal distribution itself. The most probable configuration is the one that has the largest number of the, the, the largest number of states. You know, so each one of these is a possible state with, you know, in which S equals zero. So the most probable configuration is the peak of the distribution. So before doing anything, uh, or you know, before proving this, there is going to be a value S1 hat for which the distribution is maximum. Um, the value of the distribution is maximum, and that is the most probable configuration. So that is the spin of the most probable configuration. OK, so can you give me like another 10 minutes or so? Yes? I have a meeting, Professor. At, just give me until 1025. Is that OK? Yeah, it's at 10.30. Okay, good. So we know that the spin and the energy um, are essentially the same thing. So uh, before contact, the degeneracy So the number of states that are available and that are equally likely, that is the definition of uh, degeneracy, is G1, N1, U1, and G2, N2, U2. Uh, after contact, this is before. Now, after contact, so when they are in thermal contact, the that number is going to be sum over all the possible energies U1, G1, N1, U1, G2, N2, U minus U1. So distribution is going to be, it's going to have a peak at U1 hat. Okay, so the, the peak is going to have a maximum where dg equals what?
you're trying to get the extreme zero right so calculus one right um so dg is equal to the derivative of g1 times g2. So from the uh, product rule, you get g2 bg1 plus g1 dg2. Okay, to get dg1 and dg2, we use the total derivative. So dg1, which is a function of n1 and u1, is the partial der derivative of g1 with respect to u1 at constant uh, n1, du1 plus partial derivative of G1 derivative with respect to N1 at constant U1 dN1. Okay, so that's the total derivative. Um, but we know that dN1 is equal to zero because the number of particles is not changing. Well, that's nice. It's lucky for us, we can get rid of this term. It's equal to zero. Uh, dg2 uh, of n2 and u2, it's gonna be derivative, uh, partial derivative of g2 with respect to u2 at constant n2 d u2. And it also has the dn term, but we know that that is zero. Okay, so we can rewrite dg. You know, we have dg1, dg2. So let's rewrite it. It's going to be a partial derivative of g1 with respect to u1 at constant n1 g2, du1, which comes from the, well, this one is this one, and the g2 comes from the product rule, plus g1, uh, partial derivative of g2 with respect to u2 at constant n2, du2. <coughs> And this is equal to zero because we want the, uh, the extremum. And this is equation um, 2.19. Okay, so we said that du is equal to zero, so the total energy is conserved. And this is equal to du1 plus du2. So du2 equals negative du1 or vice versa, right? So then we can um, Mm, okay, yes. So this is equal to zero. So we can put, move this one to the other side as negative, right? And I'm gonna remove this one to make it a little more clear. And we can put, 
this du2 is negative du1, so we can make this one positive, and this one du1. And we can get rid of the du1s. Okay, so now we have this expression, which looks a little better. We are going to divide by G1, G2 on both sides. Uh, so we're just you know, um, multiplying times one essentially. So here we can get, we can cancel out the G2, G2s, and here we can cancel out the G1s. Okay. So It's one over G2, I'm gonna put it over here so that it looks nicer. Okay, have you seen this um, expression before? Something similar probably in applied chemical thermodynamics. Yeah, uh, so that is called the logarithmic. Uh, uh, derivative. So you know, if you remember the derivative of the of the natural um, natural log is one over you know f x over here. So we can move this one over G1 uh, in here. So this is gonna be derivative of the natural log of G1 with respect to U1 at constant N1. And we do the same thing here. So this is the derivative of the natural log of G2 with respect to U2. constant n2. Uh, this is equation uh, 2.20. Okay, so I told you that I was going to end at 10.25. So I'm just going to give you the last definition of today. We are going to define uh, the entropy sigma, which is a function in this case of n and u, as the natural log of the multiplicity. So then we can rewrite this as Okay, this is a pretty important definition. If you have seen Boltzmann's um, tombstone, you're gonna see something like that. That is entropy. It's just the natural log of the number of states available to the system, the natural log of the multiplicity. So whenever we talked about entropy, we're just really talking about how many ways can the system arrange itself to have the same energy or magnetic moment, whatever, um, that you're observing. And I guess I will leave it there, but if these two things are equal, another thing that is equal when the two objects are in contact, thermal contact, is the temperature. So this, uh, well, it's actually going to be one over, one over t. This is also the definition 
definition of temperature comes from these. And we will see that next time. All right. Thank you for your attention. Any questions or comments? Sir. Yes. I do have a question about the homework. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you mind if you can explain like what what does he mean in the last question? What what do what what do they want? Because I don't really get that. Uh, this is problem set two. The last one. Yeah, set two. Uh, okay, I don't remember the problem, but why don't you uh, put a meeting on my calendar? We can talk today. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh huh. Anything else? No. Do you guys want me to make uh, teams for for the literature discussion that is due, that is due today? Or do you prefer to write something on the forum? I mean, writing's easier because uh, people you sometimes aren't available at the same time you are. Yeah, well, there's like 30 people in the class, so <laughs> you can find someone, I'm pretty sure. What What's due today? The literature discussion. So there's a paper that is that was posted last week, and you have to read it and answer some questions that I uh, came up with about the paper. If we decided to do the teams option, then that would sort of be just more of like not answering it in the forum, but just answering it within our group, right? Like discussing, having an active discussion about the questions you posted, correct? Yeah, so essentially you can read the paper. You know, it's pretty short. It's like um, less than two pages. And there are a few questions to guide the discussion. So you just create a, a Teams meeting, right, with your uh, you know, three or four people. And just discuss the questions when you're when when you're ready. Just record, you know, your your conclusions. Um, Ten minutes, fifteen minutes, if you want, and that's it. I think that's easier than, and you know, more more enriching than writing the something on the forum discussion. I agree, but I I do understand that you know sometimes scheduling is difficult, so that's why you have that option as well. So do you want me to suggest groups to you? No, maybe not for this time, but for next time. OK, so this is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to send you a reminder, and if you want if you want me to put you in a group, uh, you should reply to that message that I'm going to send you. If you already have a group or you don't want to be in a group, then do not reply to it. OK? Sounds good? Yes, sir. Thank you. OK. It's a, it's a cool paper. It's a short reading. I'll see you later then. Bye.